we've lost any real focus on human flourishing. So we don't even notice how good the world is. And when we talk about, say, polar bears, right? I love polar bears. They're actually my favorite animal. But it's crazy that we talk about polar bears like this polar bear has to move from one piece of ice to another, and that should make us cry. But three billion people with no energy, nobody cares at all. You're a philosopher. What are you doing talking about fossil fuels? Yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing. I don't know. You, a lot of people who follow me, probably not most people, have seen this clip where I'm in, uh, testifying in front of the Senate in front of uh, Barbara Boxer. And I'm from California, so she's my senator. And I give this whole presentation explaining why I think that some of the then Obama administration's policies were in the wrong direction. And she just like dismisses all of that. And she just asked me, Mr. Mr. Epstein, she, that's how she pronounced my name. Uh, Epstein, <laughs> right? Are you, are you a scientist? And I said, no, I'm a philosopher. And she said, oh, well, you know, why do we have a philosopher? And I said, it's to teach you how to think more clearly. And that's really how I, how I think about it. I mean, my, so my background is actually, I sort of was an aspiring tech entrepreneur until I was 20. I sort of went to a very elite math, science, computer science, high school. I was, when I went to Duke, that's what I, I was planning on being a tech entrepreneur. And actually fell in love with philosophy because I found that for me it was the most practical subject uh, because philosophy deals, you can think of it as three things. It deals with our methods, our assumptions, and our values. And we could go into any of those and we may end up mentioning all of them. But all three of those things are fundamental to uh, every kind of thought process uh, that exists. So, for example, like the world is obsessed with renewable energy. Why is the world obsessed with renewable energy instead of, say, cost-effective energy or even low-carbon energy? Why renewable? And I would argue that's ultimately a value issue. People think there's a certain value in doing something that can be repeated over and over and over again or something that is sort of drawing on more supposedly natural forces like the sun and the wind versus digging stuff up from the ground. That's that's a moral issue, a value issue. That's not an issue of – it's not like a scientific issue – but people think it's a scientific issue. And so it doesn't strike most people as bad that we oppose nuclear, even though that's a non-carbon source of energy that I believe is much more promising than solar wind. So it's just one example among many of how methods, assumptions, and values shape everything. And so I, my goal was to be a practical philosopher. And so for the first seven years of my career, I just wrote about everything. And I was just trying to apply philosophy to help people think more clearly about every issue. So it was like cloning, foreign policy, uh, the economy. And then with energy, I it was the first thing that I really wanted to become an expert in. And I think the thing that appealed to me about it was this is the industry that powers every other industry. So sort of like philosophy is the science that guides every other science. And I do think of philosophy as a science. Like energy is the industry that powers every other industry. And so our thinking about energy affects uh, everything. So if we make a decision, you know, that doubles the price of oil, like that has ramifications for everything in the world because energy is what powers our machines and our machines are what uh, accomplish just about all the productive work that exists in the world. So that's, that's why I got interested in it and why I think philosophy has to deal with energy in general and then how we think about fossil fuels in particular. You talk about the fact that the fossil fuels climate change debate has a lot of actors contributing to it, from mm -hmm. physicists to climatologists to meteorologists to the numbers people to the policymakers, and mm -hmm. quite rightly, that thing about if you're in a dark room trying to touch an elephant and you could feel different bits of it, no one really uh -huh. has that entire perspective. Is there mm -hmm. a role on both sides of this debate, do you think, for someone to come in like yourself, who is perhaps an all-rounder and can start to pull together what all of this means as opposed to just looking very narrow and deep within one domain? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm biased, but I think so. And I think so in two different respects. So one is just with any interdisciplinary question where nobody is going to be a specialist in all the different elements. So if you just think of the issue of climate, I mean, it clearly involves or should clearly involve things like you know, just all the physical things related to how rising CO2 levels affect the global climate system. But then because the rising CO2 levels come from using fossil fuels, it it involves all of our economy. It involves energy economics, questions like can solar and wind actually replace what fossil fuels do, that kind of thing. So it's clearly an interdisciplinary question. So you need you need some sort of generalist who has hopefully good judgment to then survey the relevant experts and decide you know, or at least make a good judgment, you know, what's the best thing. So I think that's true. And, and I do try to do that. I think the more 
important thing though that people don't understand is that it's very possible for almost everybody to be thinking incorrectly about an issue. And so I just want to summarize very quickly why I think almost everyone thinks incorrectly about the issue of, of climate. And this is independent of what the scientific facts happen to be. So I'll try to make this quick, but I think it's important. Like, I think there are three principles of thinking about our impact on climate that almost everyone will agree with, but almost nobody uses. And so that's always an interesting situation where everyone agrees that it's right if, if presented to them, but nobody uses it. So one is that we should think of cl what we call climate change, or I'd say climate impact, we should think of it as a side effect of fossil fuel use. So just like I think, you know, I decide to take a COVID-19 vaccine, I evaluate the benefits and the side effects. You need to do that with everything. So when you're thinking of climate impacts, you need to not just think of the climate impacts and certainly not just the negative ones. You need to think of the benefits that come along with them. So that's one principle. And I think that's pretty flagrantly violated. People just say like, oh, let's listen to the scientists by which they mean climate scientists, but they don't talk about the benefits of fossil fuels. But obviously we should. The second thing is we need to not look only at the benefits of fossil fuels in general, we need to look at the benefits of fossil fuels that specifically neutralize climate danger and can neutralize the negative potential impacts of rising CO2. So, you know, when I take a COVID-19 vaccine, it has some side effects, you know, they're pretty minor in my experience, and I think most people's, but you still have those side effects. The, the vaccine itself doesn't cure its own side effects, right? And that's true with antibiotics and other things. But what's interesting about fossil fuels is they do often cure their own side effects. Because what fossil fuels are providing is energy. And energy allows us to use machines to produce value for us. And so you see in the issue of climate, we can use, let's say, let's say rising CO2 levels cause some challenge with drought. Okay. But fossil fuels also power the machines that alleviate drought. So you have to factor that in. And when you look at the last 100 years, it's really interesting because over the last century, if you tally how many people are dying from climate-related disasters like extreme temperatures, drought, uh, wildfire, storms, floods, those are down 98%. So that's really astounding. Like your, your likelihood of dying from a climate-related disaster is 1 50th of what it used to be despite rising CO2 levels for the last 100 plus years. So that either means that the rising CO2 levels haven't done any net damage or that they have sort of been a net negative, but the positive of what I call climate mastery from fossil fuels has far, far outweighed it. So when, you're, when we're thinking, we have to look at the benefits, but specifically the climate mastery benefits. And then the third thing, and this really brings up the issue of values, is when we're looking at the climate impacts of fossil fuels, we cannot assume that they are mostly or all negative, let alone catastrophic. We're certainly open to that possibility, but we need to be open to positive, neutral, and negative impacts. And so one example that I found very revealing, because I didn't even think about it before I started studying this, is the obvious phenomenon of the fertilizer effect, which is that when we put more CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, you have a lot more plant growth. And it's really astounding how much global greening there has been that can be directly attributed to rising CO2. And in the history of the planet, it kind of makes sense because we're at about, we're less than one-tenth the historical high of CO2. And a lot of the history, the history of life on this planet where life really flourished was when you had plants big enough to feed dinosaurs and they needed a lot more CO2 than we could possibly provide. So that doesn't mean it's all good. It just means we cannot have the bias that it's bad. Even with warmth, we can't have the bias that it's bad. It turns out cold-related deaths uh, exceed heat-related deaths by a factor of 15. And in general, and every, every climate scientist will agree with this, in general, the way global warming works is it warms mostly places that are the colder, more polar regions of the earth. It warms more during the colder seasons like winter, and it warms more at night, which are generally the times we want warmth. So it's not to say it can't cause negatives, but we have to be open to positive, neutral, and negatives. And what I see with climate is people have this assumption that if we impact climate, it's, it's wrong, it must be a disaster, and we should immediately get rid of fossil fuels. And I, I think that's ultimately a, a kind of a moral and ultimately a religious assumption. I think that, that the root of all of what I call climate catastrophe, and we'll go into the details, but is not that there's actually an existential catastrophe for human beings. I don't think there's any evidence of that. I do think we impact the climate a significant amount. But I think it's based on this idea that it's immoral for us to impact the climate. And when we do something we think is immoral, we expect it to be bad. It's a lot like religion where if you, you know, if you do the wrong thing, like if you violate the commandments, then you go to hell. And I think that that the whole global warming climate catastrophe is really kind of a secularized religious uh, hell narrative. Because I think if you look at the benefits of the fo of fossil fuels, the climate mastery benefits, and you actually look at the impacts, 
I don't even think you can show the impacts, the climate impacts on their own are net negative. I don't think anyone can prove that, let alone that they're so bad that we should do without the energy that billions of us use to, to flourish and that billions more need. Can you sink into that a little bit more, the perfect planet premise, I think you call it? Yeah, and sometimes I call it the, the delicate nurture premise. And I think of it as just so you get, the, I call the overall thing the, uh, the anti-impact framework. And so that you can summarize the anti-impact framework as it's, more, it's Im- intrinsically immoral for us to uh, impact nature significantly, and then it's, it's uh, inevitably self-destructive. And so delicate nurture of perfect planet deals with inevitably self-destructive. So if we have significant impact on nature, then somehow it's going to come back to bite us. And delicate nurture is the idea that nature in its unimpacted state, so before we start allegedly screwing it up, is a sufficient, safe, and stable, delicate balance. And so you can see this in something like uh, you know, The Lion King, which I don't want to, which I like a lot as a movie in a lot of ways, but, you know, they talk about at the beginning, you know, the delicate balance and the circle of life. And you have this idea that kind of everything is in harmony. And then if you disrupt that, then everything is going to sort of uh, go to hell. And this is not at all, this is unfortunately passes as a scientific view, but this is not a scientific view. This is just a faith-based view because there's no evidence for this at all. If you look at the history of the planet, including human beings, what you see is nature is not sufficient, safe, and stable. It is deficient, uh, dangerous, and dynamic. It's the, uh, That's why our average life expectancy historically is 30. The planet is not a very nourishing place. It's not a very safe place. And so what happens is most of our lives are just spent trying to find some kind of nourishment, some sort of protection from all of nature's dangers with very little opportunity for the kind of fulfillment that you study uh, on your show. And it's only once we figure out not only how to use tools to make ourselves more productive, but how to use tools that have non-human sources of energy, because we're very weak ourselves. But once we can make these tools that have non-sources of energy, namely machines, that's when we live in an amazing world, when machines can do work for us, like the combine harvester that can do 700 times more work, more reaping and threshing of wheat than the best manual labor. And I, I think of the world today as, as I think of it as an amazing place. I think of it an amazing place for human beings. And I think it all comes down to machines, because if you look at every all the amazing value in our world that did not exist 200 years ago, it falls into one of three categories, usually more either is a machine, you know, like my washing machine or the heating machines or the cooling machines like that makes me super comfortable, or it's produced by a machine, like my whole house is produced by machines, like hundreds of machines ultimately, or it's produced by time freed up by machines. You think of like what both of us do for a living, like that's only possible because machines allow us to produce the basics so easily that we can have jobs like practical philosopher and, you know, modern wisdom uh, (laughs) expert or whatever your exact thing is. And so I, people tend to think of today's world as bad. And I think of it as it's not perfect, but it's, I think of it as an amazing world where we have machine laborers like serving us and making our lives amazing. And so much of what we experience as like the stability of things is only the stability of having mass machine labor that you do not experience nature as stable. If you live in nature, draw the line for me between energy and that well-being. Then the more energy that we produce, the more machines that we can fuel and the greater the human flourishing. Is that The basic premise? Yeah. And so one way I've come up with to explain this is what I call the private jet problem. So I'll just speak for myself. I cannot, unfortunately, afford to travel via private jet. Me and you both. uh, A lot. Um, And why can't I? We have all the technology, right? We know how to do it. But it's not cost effective, as in the value most people can get from it is not worth all the value that they need to put into it, including uh, human time. So let's say, you know, private jet round trip costs 50 grand. Well, maybe it saves me five hours total or 10 hours total, but I don't, I can't make enough money to justify that. Whereas Tim Cook can, right? It's total, or Warren Buffett, like Warren Buffett has a private jet called the indefensible, but it's not indefensible (laughs) because his time is so valuable. So for him, a private jet is cost effective, but for most of us, it isn't. And one thing to notice about the modern world is it's a very rare phenomenon that a life-giving machine is not cost-effective. You take like a washing machine. A washing machine is cost-effective. Now, a washing machine, it does take human time and resources to make it possible because we have to build it, 
and we have to provide the fuel, the energy to operate it. But we figured out how to do so with little enough human time and resources where most of us can afford it. Although there are billions of people who can't, and that's why I say we need even more uh, cost-effective energy. So the idea is that the more cost-effective machine labor is, the more the more we can benefit from machines. When it's not cost-effective, it doesn't matter if it exists, we can't uh, benefit from it. Just like in previous generations, you know, people like Kings had a lot of our modern standard of living, not all of it, but a lot of it, but it wasn't cost-effective to provide. It required basically abusing human beings as machines. So cost-effective machine labor is like the key to everything, and the key to cost-effective machine labor is cost-effective energy, because the energy is the food for the machines. And, and it's one way, we just wanna make sure. So you think of the private jet, it's not just the fuel of the private jet, although that is very expensive and that's a big variable. You have to think what made the private jet, and the private jet was ultimately made by thousands of different machines. If you think about the machines that mined for the materials and processed the materials and transported them and manufactured them, et cetera, et cetera. So if you think of every machine that we have as the product of thousands of machines, that machine not only uses the energy it operates on, but the, machine, the energy that the thousands of machines operated on to make it. And so you get this idea that the cost of energy determines the cost of everything. So if we have energy that is super cost effective, and, and I think of it as it's low cost, it's on demand, it's versatile, so it can power every kind of machine, and it's on a global scale of billions of people in thousands of places, if you can produce energy with that kind of ultra cost effectiveness, then you have billions of people who can benefit from the miracle of machine labor. But if you double, triple, quadruple the price of energy, then more and more of our amazing machines become like private jets. They're so this, inaccessible. This sounds great. It sounds, yeah, I, I want modern world with loads of things done for me so that I can spend time on myself. But you haven't talked about any of the externalities. And there's mm -hmm. this many, many, many stats and many people who are probably part of the green movement who are listening now who are thinking, yeah, 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 that's great, Alex. But <laughs> the acidification of the oceans and the melting of the ice caps and the polar bears are losing their homes and we're polluting and there's smog uh -huh. and 97% of climate scientists say that climate change is real. What, how can you lay out some, some insights to do with fossil fuels externalities that might surprise people? Sure. I mean, it, it come, and there's also, you know, the other thing they'll raise is, well, can't we do it without fossil fuels? So we can talk about that as well, like let's not use fossil fuels, let's use these um, uh, other sources, which I'd be in favor of if, if you could. I'd be in favor of anything that's that's better. But if, yeah, we talk about what's called the externalities, the first thing I wanna observe about this whole externalities perspective is it is it violates the, the principles that I talked about uh, at the beginning. So when people are talking about the externalities, that's, a, that's kind of a technical way, and it's the negative externalities, notice. That's a technical way of saying, we're gonna ignore the benefits and we're just gonna focus on uh, the negative side effects. If you think of the positive externalities of fossil fuels, like take something like the existence of the modern internet. Like when we were, when people were paying for coal in the 1970s and 1980s, which provided the vast majority of the electricity. So people would say, oh, that has a negative externality because it puts CO2 in the atmosphere and that's causing warming. And we can talk about the consequence of that. But what about the positive externality of all of the time and machines freed up for innovation that made possible the internet? And then all the things the internet has made possible in terms of medicine. And just think about like how many people are alive right now with something like COVID-19 because of the internet, because of the knowledge that's disseminated, because of you know the rapid ability to develop an mRNA vaccine. Like all of that came from the coal industry. And yet all of these so-called economists, I mean, they're, they are economists, but I think they're, they have the same kinds of prejudices as everyone else philosophically. So they're so focused on the negative externalities, they can't see uh, the positive externalities. There's also, I'll try to make this point quickly, there's kind of a technical point about externalities that some people might be interested in. Um, ex externalities is like, the basic idea of externalities is that certain kinds of negatives and actually positives aren't reflected in the price of the thing. And so then it, some economist or economist king should like manipulate the prices. But there's a core reason this is a really bad idea because that assumes that the price of the thing reflects the value of the thing. But the prices of things don't reflect the value of things. They reflect the value that very that certain people, they reflect the minimum value of things to people. Like you wouldn't pay it if it wasn't worth it to you. But you think about oil. Like when my life gets sick, if I get pulled by a helicopter to a hospital, what was that oil worth to me? Was that worth $3 a gallon? No, I would pay uh, whatever I have, right? So 
part of what's going on with ignoring the benefits of fossil fuels with this kind of pseudo-scientific, pseudo-economic externality thing is we're ignoring the fact that the value we get from fossil fuels is far, far greater than the price we pay from fossil fuels, which is not the same, say, compared to like Barbie dolls. Although for some people, you know, that may be their life. So there's all of these dynamics that are causing people to ignore the truth that the benefit we get from fossil fuels far, far outweighs the side effects. And then the other thing there I would, I would point out, so I think of it as, let's just say I'm right, and, and we'll talk about it in a minute, that there is no near-term replacement for fossil fuels. So that to have this ultra cost-effective energy that's low cost, on demand, versatile, global scale, like there's no other way to do it without fossil fuels. I, I can prove that later, but I can't, like if I'm right, then to justify restricting fossil fuel use in a world where 3 billion people have virtually no energy and 3 billion more have amounts of energy you and I would consider completely unacceptable, like you would need to prove like a total cataclysm from CO2 to justify depriving people of energy. Energy is that important. So I think that's how we should go into the question of side effects. And the fact that 99.9% .9 of people, including climate scientists, don't look at it that way. They don't look at it as, oh, fossil fuels make our world possible, including they make it livable as we know it, including we're only as safe from climate as we are because of fossil fuels. That just shows that there's this whole bias against, against the benefits and only look at the side effects. And then if you look at the side effects, you need to really look at them from a human perspective. Are they bad? And you need to be precise about them. And you need to look for positive, neutral, and negative. So, if, you know, you went through various things like uh, the polar bears is one where, you know, the populations are growing and in some ways in a way that's dangerous to people. And so one thing that's kind of dishonest is people ignore that narrative. Like they brought up polar bears when it seemed like they were going to shrink. But then when they did it, nobody brought them up and like, oh, I'm so happy. I'm so ha like Al Gore. There's this meme like, you know, when Al Gore was born, there were only 7,000 polar bears. Now only 40,000 remain, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So there's just this whole bias. Um, so I forget the other categories you you, you brought up. Like well, So acid acidification of the seas, coral reefs being destroyed. Yeah, okay, let's, let's deal with that one. So acidification. So this is an interesting term for a supposedly scientific movement. Acid has a very definite meaning on the pH scale. So it's like lower than seven. So seven is neutral, you know, above seven is alkaline or basic. And so you're talking about the oceans going from about 8.2 to 8.1. So you should call it neutralization, uh, not acidification. So it's used to like act like, oh, it's acid. Um, and so there's a real question of why do we expect that going from 8.2 to 8.1 is going to be a catastrophe at all, let alone that justifies depriving billions of people uh, of energy? Why do we think that way? And I think part of it is we don't, I mean, to the value issue, I don't think we value human life and human flourishing enough in these things. So we can talk about that. But definitely it's a delicate nurture premise. The idea that, oh, the ocean that we inherited was this perfect, delicate balance. And if anything changes in the pH, everything is going to go to hell. And if you just look at the history of the planet, this makes absolutely no sense because the oceans were much more neutral in the past when you had explosions of life. Ocean species deal with much more dramatic shifts in the pH than we're talking about. They don't, it's like temperature. You don't deal with one temperature. You don't deal with one pH. You deal with a range. So a shift in temperature is a shift in the range and the shift in pH is a shift in the range. And also some of the most prolific seas in the world are the, are the closest to neutral in the world. So I, I think it really is coming from this philosophical or religious perspective that we expect it to be bad. And then where scientists fit in is you can have like selective science where the government says, hey, I really want to see some negative consequences of fossil fuels, can you? what can you show me in the ocean? And of course, there are gonna be a bunch of negative consequences in the ocean, I mean, even real ones, right? Any change is gonna have certain kinds of negatives. But the, the question is, are you getting the full picture? And is this anything on the level that we should be considered depriving people of energy? Is it even possible that it's on the level of the amount of benefit we get from global greening on the land, which nobody wants to talk about. So notice they only want to talk about the things that are negative about fossil fuels and not positive, and they have no concern about depriving billions of people uh, of, a, uh, of a modern life. So I forget what other examples you brought up, but that's another one too, where you can see, I just want to point out, it's like the philosophy and the framework is guiding this and it's distorting science. So there are a lot of people doing good science on this, but that only works if, if you're asking people to really give you positive and negative neutral side effects, and then if you integrate those with the benefits. Oh, the, the one other thing to say about the ocean stuff is, why do we care about ocean acidification, so-called? Why do we care about it? Like, presumably a big part of it is because we want a prolific ocean 
that we can get food from. I like seafood. A lot of people like seafood. Well, from a human flourishing perspective, the natural ocean is a desert. It's a lot of the how prolific the ocean is is actually related to our activities and our waste. That's why that's one reason why you have a lot of marine thriving. What do you mean near that? coastlines? Well, just because they like you think about the ocean, like the ocean has it's it's a lot like an actual desert. It's just like there are certain things that are needed in the ocean, like like uh, iron in order to make these different kinds of plankton that, you know, it's got this whole food chain, but a lot of the lower elements of that are benefit from certain kinds of, uh, byproducts of our civilization. Cause you need that to make the food. But the real point is if we know that the ocean is a desert, why don't we actively try to improve it? And there's what's called aquaculture, which is usually, you know, that's like making modern salmon, which you see people vehemently oppose because they think it's wrong to impact nature. And even more excitingly, there's what's called mariculture. So mariculture is thinking of how do you sort of enrich a large portion of the ocean so that a lot more food appears. So they did this. There is an experiment with this uh, native tribe in Canada and this guy named, I think his name was Russ George. The, they're the Haida tribe. And they basically put a bunch of iron in a certain part of the ocean. And they just had this unbelievable proliferation of salmon. It was just, it was great. And it made sense because the iron was the limiting factor. It was the bottleneck in terms of, you know, plankton and other things existing in that, in that place. And yet was this celebrated? Did people say, Hey, let's just do this. Like, even if there are some negatives on the ocean, Hey, let's, let's, let's make the ocean bloom. No, the whole modern environmental movement had no interest in this. And in fact, they were very critical. Like one of the main climate catastrophists, Naomi Klein, she was very critical and she like described it as, I don't like this all you can eat buffet that we've made. And it, it, she said it was bad because whales were coming to this bloom and it was unnatural. So it's like, wait, do you care about the whales or you, you want them to die of natural causes versus live of human causes? So it, again, it reveals this very I call this the anti-impact framework. It's the anti-human impact framework. So the idea that everything we do to nature is immoral and it must it must be self-destructive. And that dogma is just influencing anything. So if you actually care about the oceans from any kind of human perspective, let's keep using fossil fuels and then let's see how we can engineer the oceans to be far more prolific than they are right now. And let's get let's improve this ocean desert. Does this fear of impacting nature and the perfect planet premise and the other structures that you've given us, does that explain why, if what you're saying is true, almost no one talks about it? I'm not hearing politicians campaign on it. I'm not... On, on, on which? Well, on any pro-fossil fuel talking points. Mm -hmm. Why is that the case? It, why is it that fossil fuels are so demonized? Is it just, is it all explained by the perfect planet premise? The fact that humans are destroying mother nature and it's kind of across a multiple a few different streams at the moment. It seems almost cool to be human hating, to be yeah. whatever the opposite of anthropocentric is like anthropo something else, some other version. Well, they just... would call it biocentric, although that's misleading. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, it's a tricky thing to even isolate because it's a specific anti-humanism. Like I call it yes. human racism sometimes because like <laughs> everything the human race does is bad and yeah. everything. Cause why it's do you not think, like a, why do you think yeah, that is just generally at the moment? What is this ambient pervasive human racism that we're seeing across not just the environmental movement, but a lot of things at the moment? Well, I think if you look at the history of it, it, you know, it really started emerging in the sixties and seventies. In turn, like if you look at the kind of environmental philosophy of even, let's say, the pioneers of the greenhouse effect, or not, not the pioneer discoverers who discovered that if we put more CO2 into the atmosphere, it should have a warming influence, like they were generally optimistic about what that would mean. And they talked about like, oh, yeah, it'll mean more plant growth and we'll be able to grow crops in Siberia and won't that be great? So it's interesting that you see how much the philosophy shapes things. And, you know, w Ralph Waldo Emerson used to call coal like portable climate. Like the idea was, yeah, climate isn't very good naturally, but we can make it artificially good or unnaturally good through energy. In the 60s and 70s, you have this idea that it's wrong to impact nature and it's inevitably self-destructive. I mean, this is a primitive religious idea. It's been around forever. But in terms of having cultural dominance, it's really in the 60s and 70s. And I think a lot of the reason it's it, and it was it was spread in very calculated ways throughout the throughout the educational system and then throughout the media system. And if you ask, and, and throughout the political system, and if you ask like, why then? 
I think a big part of it, and there's a great book uh, by Ayn Rand, my favorite philosopher, called The New Left, The Anti-Industrial Revolution, and she was living through it and commenting on it. And there was very explicitly, it was very explicit that the anti-capitalist left needed a new cause as communism was collapsing and once the Vietnam War was over. And the Vietnam War is a whole mess that you know, sort of beside the point, but that was like their issue. Then the Vietnam War is over, and they very said ex they said explicitly like, let's make our issue that capitalism destroys quote the environment because they had their their previous issue was capitalism destroys the worker, it destroys productivity, socialism will make us productive. That didn't work out well at all. Like everyone starved in the communist countries. So Ayn Rand made this point that the the anti capitalist side could either choose to embrace if they really valued production, they could embrace capitalism. Or if it wasn't, if opposing capitalism wasn't really about production, they would find a new reason to oppose capitalism. And the, the reason they found is capitalism, quote, destroys the environment. Now, this is not at all true, because if you think about, like, you look at the environment of a, the Soviet Union or of North Korea, like, it's horrible, in part because it's a lot of it hasn't, the natural environment hasn't been neutralized enough, but also they just pollute all over the place because they have no property rights. In general, what leads to good environments of all kinds is property rights because people protect what they own and they have wealth to clean up their environment, et cetera, et cetera. But there were certain abuses in the U.S. environment and, and European environments that people could point to and say, hey, look, you know, this lake can catch fire. This city has more air pollution than we would want. And I think a big mistake that the pro-capitalism side made as they didn't own that issue. They didn't say, no, we're for a really good environment for human beings. Like we like clean air and clean water and productivity, like capitalism is where you can have it all. Instead, they ceded that to the anti-capitalist side. And so the anti-capitalist side started identifying with environment, but it wasn't at the core, it wasn't really about clean air and clean water. It was about eliminating our impact on nature, but those two got blended together. So if you look at the idea of green, green means minimizing our impact. But what does that mean? Does that mean that we don't build washing machines, that we don't build roads, that we don't build factories? Or does it mean that we don't senselessly destroy natural beauty or senselessly pollute things? Like I'm in favor of not of not senselessly destroying things and 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 not senselessly polluting, but I want roads and factories and all of these things. And so, but they blended together. Like either you're for the environment, which lumps together like you're for being green, which lumps together like impacts on nature that are good and impacts on nature that are bad for us, or you just sort of hate the environment. You're not green. And part of my own mission was to give a pro-human alternative to the, to the green movement. So I think of it as the human flourishing movement, where we're for human flourishing, which means a good environment for human beings. But that means we very highly value uh, production and intelligently impact nature. We don't worship nature. We enhance, we optimize uh, we improve nature. So you can love nature, but realize it's very deficient on its own. So it, it needs to be dramatically engineered and enhanced. And, and I think that that will have appeal. And I think it is growing in terms of my own, my own movement and my own following, but it's the other side is so entrenched and they constantly want us to think that if you want a good environment, you have to be in sync with all of these anti-industrial causes. And you, what's notable is they've always had some reason why industry is bad, particularly fossil fuels are bad. So first it was, we're gonna run out of fossil fuels. Then it's, oh, they're gonna make the atmosphere just totally polluted. Then it's catastrophic global cooling. Then it's catastrophic global warming. There's never any change in the certainty that fossil fuels, the core of capitalist civilization, is going to lead to some disaster. We just don't know which one. And so what that reveals is it's again, this delicate nurture idea. If we're impacting things a lot, it must be, uh, it must be bad. And these people are so, I mean, I'm talking about the leaders now. They're so blind to how good the world is. The stat I think is most revealing is when I was born in 1980, 42% of the world lived on less than $2 a day. Like think about that, less than $2 a day. So it's like $750, $800 a year. Like that is nothing. And now it's less than 10%. So four out of 10 people were in this desperate poverty. Now just 40, 41 years later, it's less than one out of 10. This is the world is such a much so much better a place for those people and nobody talks about it. And so this shows how powerful philosophy is because our whole philosophy today is dominated by minimal impact. Let's not change nature. We've lost any real focus on human flourishing. So we don't even notice how good the world is. And when we talk about, say, you know, talking about polar bears, right? I love polar bears. They're actually my favorite animal. 
But it's crazy that we talk about polar bears like this polar bear has to move from one piece of ice to another and that's that should make us cry. But three billion people with no energy, nobody cares at all about. And as I tell in Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, like what that means, if you haven't ever lived it or seen it, I mean, I tell a story about like a young woman who has a baby and where we live, they'd have the baby would have an incubator. It's a premature baby to have an incubator would be fine. You wouldn't even remember it a few months later, but there they don't have reliable electricity. So that, that baby just dies. And you see like this, this tragedy of lack of energy is happening everywhere around the world to billions of people. And nobody cares because our philosophy has told us to care about minimizing our impact on nature instead of maximizing human flourishing. You talk, you give a timeline in the book of these Cassandras, the people who make particular predictions. I'm just laughing because that's my girlfriend's name too. Uh, sorry, Cassandra. Um, She's but, not like that at all. You know what I mean though, right? You talk about in yeah. the 70s, this is predicted in 20 years time. 20 years time rolls around and still not there. Okay, now there's a new problem. Now there's a new problem. Now there's a new problem. Some of the people that are listening will be thinking, right, this sounds great, but we've got renewable energy. We know that solar and wind and hydro are potentials that will be able to replace what we're using at the moment. Why why can't we just do that? Well, I think it's it's those points need to be looked at independently. So first of all, with the, the Cassandras or Cassandras, I think it's important they're not that because they're wrong. Like the original Cassandra, Cassandra, my girlfriend is Cassandra, I forget what the original She's going to come in. If she's somewhere near, she's going to say, is he, is Alex shouting <laughs> <No>. me? <laughs> Honey, what no, do you she, want? <laughs> she, she's been, she's been warned that I'm on a, on a podcast. Now. Uh, she'll be happy that she, she gets got a mentioned. shout out about yeah. 20 times. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, yeah, they haven't been right. Whereas the original Cassandra was right. That's the idea. Like if someone right, who wasn't being li listened to versus somebody who is boys is the boy who cried wolf which is much more, except we still don't. And, but interesting that people think, oh, the wolf is finally coming. So there's that whole thing the, the, so that, so that people have been totally wrong about fossil fuels causing a catastrophe. And in fact, fossil fuels have made life much better. That's kind of one thing. And then there's another thing of, okay, can we do the same things with, uh, that we do with fossil fuels? Can we do those with alternatives. And that's some, certainly something worth exploring, but you have to be clear, are we exploring it from the perspective of life is amazing, let's make it even better with potential supplements or substitutes? Or is it, no, fossil fuels are going to end the world, so we need to just drop everything and sacrifice everything and just come up with some crash scheme to re replace it with alternatives. So I think that that's why I say they're independent, and I think there is no evidence at all, despite what people say, that from a human flourishing perspective, there's anything resembling a catastrophe. And I think the path of fossil fuels is um, is that they're going to keep make li making life better and better. But let's say somebody is not convinced of that they think I'm at least seriously concerned about future rises in CO2 levels. And, and I haven't given you enough evidence here not to be. So that's that's a plausible thing. CO2 is different from other emissions because CO2 aggregates in the atmosphere. So like if you have smog, it just disappears from the atmosphere. It doesn't build up over time. But CO2 does build up over time. So we had a little less than 0.03% in the atmosphere before we started using fossil fuels. And now we're a little above 0.04%. Uh, we could easily go to 0.05% or beyond. And there is a greenhouse effect so we can expect a warming impact. There's a question of, of how much, and we can expect that to have other impacts for various reasons. I don't think those will even be negative at all on balance, but let's say you're very concerned about that. I respect that. It is legitimate to look at alternatives, but if we go back to the philosophy, you need to look at alternatives from a, a human flourishing perspective. So that means you want energy that's cost effective. And if you're concerned about CO2, you want it that's low or almost no CO2. There's actually nothing with no CO2 today because fossil fuels, fo well, here's part of the challenge. Fossil fuels don't pr just provide electricity, which we have the most alternatives for. They also provide heat. And so residential heat and particularly industrial heat, which is very high levels of heat. And that's very hard to provide cost effectively with electricity. That's why the most cost effective thing for home heating is natural gas. And for industrial heating is often natural gas. And it's pretty staggering price differentials. So, so much of our society is based on just directly burning fossil fuels for industrial heat. And then there's heavy duty transportation where there's no replacement for fossil fuels for a while. Like you're talking about cargo ships and planes and all these things. I mean, everything people are talking about is not even close to, you know, any reasonable prototype, let alone commercialization. So this points out to, it is a real bitch if you, if you, if you had a, 
crisis or anything resembling a crisis with fossil fuels, like you would view that as a tragic situation because fossil fuels are so good. And if you had to somehow figure out a, a near term replacement, like that would be so daunting and so upsetting. And the fact that people aren't upset about it just shows that they don't really value that they don't value the benefits of fossil fuels. They don't really understand energy. So if we look at it from the human flourishing perspective, there is a CO2 issue. If there was, you know, what you want to do is find every cost effective means you can of producing energy with little or no CO2. And the most obvious candidates would be hydroelectric energy and nuclear energy, because hydroelectric, we can produce that at quite low cost reliably, but it's limited by location. So you can't do it everywhere, but where you can do it, you know, if you have a climate crisis or anything like that, not a crisis, but even a problem, that's good. Notice who is opposing hydroelectric power, the modern environmental movement. They Why? shut down. Why? It has too much impact on nature. So it's, again, the anti-impact framework. They'll say like, oh, it interfered with the salmon. It's taking up too much space. It interferes with free-flowing rivers. And you think like, wait a second. I thought you said the world was going to end and we can't dam a river. And it just shows you the whole perspective is about minimizing our impact. It's not really about worrying about a catastrophe. Like James Cameron, right after he made that Avatar thing, which is really about global warming, like he went down to Brazil to stop them from building a dam. Like that was his immediate activity. And to him, it's one and the same because humans impacting nature is bad. So I'm going to stop it everywhere I can. And this idea that CO2 is going to kill us all, like I think of that as an excuse for shut for rationalizing, stopping, uh, stopping our, our productive impacts on nature. And then nuclear, you know, that's the most promising because that is controllable. Unlike solar and wind, it's controllable. So you can rely on it. It can be done anywhere in the world. It has these three amazing properties that only fossil fuels and nuclear have. So fossil fuels are so cost effective in large part because they're naturally concentrated energy, they're naturally stored energy, and they're naturally abundant. So natural forces have taken raw energy in nature and concentrated into a small space, stored it so we can deploy it at any time, and given us just an unbelievable amount, like way more than 10 times all that we used in all of our history, like exists still in the earth, probably way more than that. Like that's unbelievable. And that's why it's so cost effective because nature already did all this stuff to make it pretty convenient. And all we have to do is release the energy. That's sort of true of hydro, like nature brings the evaporation of water to the top of the river. Like if we had to carry the water to the top of a river of a, you know, of a hydroelectric dam ourselves, it wouldn't work, right? It'd be this perpetual motion machine that wouldn't work. But nature does that. And with nuclear, it's even more amazing because because na nature has just harnessed these unbelievable forces in the nucleus of an atom. And so if you can release those forces, it's way more concentrated than even oil, like a million times more than oil. And oil is the most concentrated thing we use in most of our civilization. That's why it's so good for mobility. Uh, so it's amazingly concentrated, it's stored, and then there's a huge amount of it. So, you know, probably tens of thousands or more years worth of it from, if you're talking about uranium and thorium, and even more if you pulled it from the ocean. So like, why aren't we, and we know that, you know, from history in the US, it was pretty cost effective to do, very reliable in the 70s. If you had anything resembling a climate crisis, you would be focused on let's use what we know about nuclear and at least do as much electricity as we can. It's harder to do the mobility and the heat, but even with nuclear, you can generate a lot of heat, so you should be able to do that. And with mobility, we have nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers and icebreakers, so it would be a real crash effort, but you should at least be trying to do that. But who is against nuclear? The modern environmental movement. It's not the oil companies that are stopping nuclear for the most part. It's the so-called environmentalists. And Why? what is it? Yeah, I know you're going to ask that. Because it's again this, it's more subtle, but it's again this issue of they impact nature too much. So part of it is it's viewed as unnatural to split the atom. It's just like, oh, they talk about radiation, like radiation is bad. Radiation is everywhere. But if humans create radiation, it's bad. And we just shouldn't be, so it's the human racism again. And particularly when you look at them talk about the waste, it's very revealing because they'll say like, oh no, what about the waste? We can't have this waste. And you think, wait, we don't actually have any problems from nuclear waste. We've been generating it for generations. Like it's not, nobody is dying of waste accidents. It's actually fairly easy to store safely. It's very compact. Maybe there are better ways of storing it. We can ultimately repurpose it for fuel, but like there's no crisis at all. It's a lot more manageable than solar waste or wind waste from all that huge mining involved in those things. But why, why are people against nuclear waste? Because it's this, there's like we created this new unnatural material and it's going to be around for millions of years. Like, okay, but if it's a pretty stable material that we can deal with, who cares? Like, that's fine. But no, humans have no right to create something that'll be around for millions of years. So it's again, this anti-humanism. If you, if you really cared about 
rising CO2 levels being a crisis for human life, again, hydro and nuclear would be your first, your, your obsession. You would not constrain yourself and really castrate yourself by saying, okay, we're only going to use sunlight and wind and, and then batteries, which are totally made from, made using fossil fuels. Like you would never make that up. You would use what's proven and tested. It's just a total empirical fact that there is nowhere in the world that runs on anything resembling solar wind and batteries. There's just nothing that does that whatsoever. I don't know if you saw this, but I, I've gotten in this little, oh, with Elon Musk, like whom I really, I was listening to an interview of yours with, um, what was her name? Like Polina Pompliano or something. Yeah. Like she is, I, I love Elon Musk in a lot of ways. So I like, I was, I started listening to that because I'm really interested in him. He's a really brilliant guy, but he really misrepresents the uh, scalability of what he does. And so he said this thing about, oh, all you need to power the world. And you can see this on twitter.com slash Alex Epstein. If you watch this in the, the near future, it'll be, be near the top. Like, oh, you can power the whole world on solar plus some batteries. That's what he said. So I ran the numbers at his best cost that he's provided for the batteries. And yeah, for those batteries that you need to back up solar for three days, which is pretty conservative, if you need to run the whole world on solar, and you know sometimes in different areas you don't have as much sunlight, like yeah, that's $400 trillion. So $400 trillion <laughs> is like six and a half times global GDP. That's just for batteries, mind you. That's not like all these other things. Involved. So this is nobody is doing this. It's a total, it's worse than a fantasy. And yet people really think that you can put solar panels, wind turbines and batteries together. And that's some amazing thing. And it's actually going to work even for electricity, let alone for industrial heat, let alone for uh, heavy duty mobility, where we don't have these electric planes or even hydro. Like we're talking about destroying our whole energy system for things that have never existed and many of which are not close to existing. And the entire world is bought into this. Everyone is saying carbon neutral net zero by 2050. And we're trying to do it while we still criminalize and demonize nuclear and we're stopping hydro all over the place. If that is not a religious cult, I don't know what it is. What about the problems of risks with nuclear spills and explosions and danger? Yeah, I mean, I'm laughing because I think it's an, it's an innocent question, but it's not innocent that it, it is a question for the public because the fact about nuclear is the safest source of energy uh, ever created and for a fairly obvious physical reason, which is that it cannot explode. So, of course, a nuclear bomb can explode, but that deals with a totally different type of uranium than exists in a nuclear power plant. The best comment ever by one of my energy heroes, a guy named uh, Peter Beckman, who's unfortunately deceased, you know, somebody said, like, hey, what happens if we blow up uh, a nuclear power plant? If terrorists blow it up, isn't that going to be a disaster? And he said, if a terrorist blows up a nuclear power plant, they should win a Nobel Prize because they'll have discovered a law of physics that doesn't exist. But Chernobyl like, blew up. No, no, it's not. It's not blowing up. Not so atomically. You can no, no, right. Well, that's very important though because people okay. associate with atomic. So Chernobyl is also interesting because Chernobyl. Well, so it's interesting. Chernobyl is the only case where you have any deaths due to radiation, which is pretty astonishing. There's only one case in all of it. And so what's interesting is it involved a type of reactor that was sort of a hybrid uh, energy producing reactor, but also sort of like a weapon that was never tried or considered in any civilized part of the world. So it's it's like you can call it nuclear, but it's not the same thing. It's just like every, you can call everything chemical in a sense, but there are certain types of uses of chemicals that are totally benign and that can't do things. So what, what they tried in Chernobyl was not even considered, let alone tried where we were and couldn't have been. And even and on top of that, and related to that, it was in the Soviet Union, which as one of my favorite economies, economists pointed out, like everything in the Soviet Union was deadly. Like imagine how many deaths there were from Soviet toasters, like a hell of a lot more than Chernobyl. So, so Chernobyl, you have a couple dozen documented deaths. You have certain like treatable conditions. And that was, you know, that was a disaster, but that shows you like, even we have a total disaster by one of the worst regimes in history using something civilized countries would never consider or allow, even then it's limited in its destructive potential. So we should be thinking about nuclear, like nuclear is the safest form of energy uh, ever. There's like solar panels, you know, solar panels, the main problem is they're not very good at producing energy reliably at low cost. But you can have solar panels have all sorts of issues. Like if you have your, if, if you know, it catches on fire and the, and the sun is still shining, there are all sorts of problems where fire departments can't deal with these houses because what you have, you, ha you have this electrical power plant on the roof of your house, right? And it's connected to batteries 
And so it's, it can be hard to shut off and you have all these issues with fires. I mean, and you know, there are different ways of dealing with this. You have wind turbines that catch on fire and go out of control. You have all the deaths involved in the mining for those things. Now, I don't think solar and wind are particularly dangerous, but empirically they are more dangerous than nuclear. The Is main that right? thing that's dangerous. Oh yeah. It's the main thing that's dangerous about them though is that they don't provide energy. And so my my basic <laughs> the most point dangerous that I want to stress, thing is being useless. Yeah, but that is really important. Like no, no energy is more dangerous than no energy. <laughs> because then you have to live in nature. I saw a video on Twitter a while ago and it was an animation of this huge sort of golem looking creature stopping a a big boulder rolling down a hill and it's symbolic of nuclear energy. Have you seen this? No. I'll try and get if I can find it, I'll make video guy Dean put it over the video here. Okay. Um basically it's just it's just a suggestion that um Chernobyl and Fukushima were reason enough and sufficiently public to cause a cascading effect that nuclear is now essentially out of the window by people that perhaps know less than they claim to know. <laughs> yeah, perhaps uh, Fukushima I think is a perfect kind of of revelation because if you look at the situation like what do most people associate fukushima with what do they associate that situation with they associate it with like a failure of a nuclear power plant yet what happened is what a tsunami kills twenty thousand people you were actually a lot safer if you were in the nuclear power plant well you really nobody of course <laughs> it's one of the safest places in the world i mean imagine 9 11 they tried to crash in a nuclear power plant like just the people in the plane would have died which would have been incredibly tragic but it wouldn't have been like like this whole terrorist thing, like look at what people can do with an airplane and a building. Like that is, nuclear has nowhere near that potential. Again, we're talking about A, providing energy, which is crucial to human beings living a modern life. And B, we're talking about these concerns that rising CO2 levels are an existential threat. And people still will just, will believe in or, or more importantly, propagate these just totally erroneous notions about nuclear. So yeah, the Fukushima thing is 20,000 people die from a tsunami. No one dies from radiation. And how do we characterize it? It's like, oh, nuclear is dangerous. No, nature is dangerous. Nuclear is safe. And of course, what well, Japan shut us down all those reactors? And they didn't even like just say, okay, maybe we shouldn't have built it in this particular place. It's This shows also the religious nature, how nuclear is put as this universal package. So it's like, oh, Chernobyl, all these places we shouldn't explore anything that involves splitting the atom. What could be more unscientific than saying, we're not going to explore nuclear physics at all. Anything that involves that advanced knowledge and skill, we are just going to put off indefinitely. All we are willing to do is to try to turn sunlight and wind gusts into energy. That's what we're going to limit it to. Like, this is crazy. Why can't we do that? Why can't we use solar and wind? <laughs> well, I mean, we did for thousands of years, and it was very bad. Um <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the percentage of renewable energy has decreased over time. What is I it? Mean, is it not not point three? No, no, no. I, and it's not. No, no. It's. Oh, I'm not sure what that language means. Not point three percent. What's the current percentage it's, of global well, it, so, energy so, output so, created by renewables? Well, so renewables is another kind of vague package. So if solar, because I promise, I promise, solar. I'm not purposefully trying to use no, 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 vague no, no, terms no. here. No, no, no. I'm me. not. I, I keep I on stepping on different landmines of that have been no, let no, down no. by other people. No, no, no. I, I'm sorry, and I didn't mean it at all personally. I just meant that that's it's, this is the terminology. So yeah, renewable because it it can renewable. There's this question: Does it include hydro, and does it include burning wood? So people usually, th and the renewable movement is mostly anti-hydro, and actually a lot of the, like the majority or or at least the most renewable in Europe is actually burning wood, and which people don't know. Often like we chop down trees in the U.S. using oil-powered chainsaws, then transport them using oil-powered cargo ships. You, oh, we chop them up, probably using natural gas or coal, into these little wood pellets, and then we stick them in a plant in Germany, and it's called carbon uh, neutral. So that's like a real process that's happening. And there's a question of like, why is this happening? And it goes to why don't we use solar and wind? It's because they're not controllable or reliable sources of energy. So I mentioned that with fossil fuels and nuclear, and to some extent hydro, you have this phenomenon of nature concentrates and stores huge amounts of energy for you, and you just have to release them. And so that's what makes it so cost effective, that nature's already done this work. If you have to concentrate and store the energy yourself, then you have to make all these machines and use all these resources to do it. And with solar and wind, the biggest problem 
is effectively storing them, is is storing enough of them so that you always have energy when you need it. And th- it's so non-cost effective that nobody does anything close to this anywhere except for people using very low energy kind of off-grid. But they're not producing anything significant. They're kind of living a low consumption lifestyle. And even that lifestyle, all the equipment is produced using fossil fuels or nuclear. It's not made using solar panels uh, and, and wind turbines. So this, what's happened, unfortunately, though, is in the the field of electricity in particular, is that to promote the idea that solar and wind and batteries are viable, instead of actually creating independent systems or power plants that can meet normal standards of reliability, like if they did that, that would be great. I'd be happy to see that. Instead, what they do is they take the existing electric grid with all of these controllable, reliable sources of energy, uh, nuclear, coal, and most importantly, natural gas, because natural gas can easily cycle up and down to adapt to changes. And so they stick solar and wind on those. And then what happens is the natural gas is constantly adjusting to them. So when the sun shines, the natural gas goes down. When the sun fades, the natural gas goes up. The same thing with the wind blowing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Batteries are so expensive that they're just a tiny, tiny percentage. Like in Texas, when we had these disasters, it was something like 40 seconds worth of energy and even something like that, 40% of that was lost. So it's just nothing, right? Batteries are a trivial thing, whatever uh, Musk talks about. So the real thing that happens is solar and wind are parasites on the grid today. And if you think logically, like, is it is it going to be more cost effective to have all these reliable power plants uh, that and then add on all these unreliable power plants plus unreliable infrastructure, or is it going to be cheaper to just have the reliable power plants? And it's way cheaper to just have the reliable power plants because you need to build almost as many of them if you have the unreliables, because the unreliables can almost always go near zero. So you always need to have 100% reliable plus all this unreliable, plus this infrastructure, plus the reliables operate really inefficiently when you cycle them up and down. It's like stop and go traffic. So it's really this mess, and which is why everywhere these unreliables are used, the price of electricity goes up. And yet we hear all this reporting about how it goes down. And this is all just energy accounting fraud. What they do is they don't look at the full system costs of solar and wind. They'll say, just look at the price of solar panels or just look at some price in isolation. But over and over, we see that the more these things are used, the more prices go up. Like Germany pays three times what the U.S. pays. The U.S. pays way more than we should pay. Coal and particularly gas prices have gone down, and yet electricity prices have gone up. There aren't too many candidates. We haven't been building a lot of new nuclear plants that are expensive. It's because the solar and wind have added cost. And then the other problem is once they add cost, people try to cut costs. And where do they cut costs? They shut down reliable power plants or they defund resiliency. So you see this in Texas where they defunded you know, weatherizing plants that could be more durable. All sorts of places around the world deal with coal and gas, deal with much lower temperatures than Texas had, no problem. But Texas did not have the same resiliency. They also didn't even have enough reliable power online, even if everything had worked perfectly, to not have significant blackouts. Because they've spent at least $66 billion on solar and wind, and that comes from other places. So you try to cut down on the reliables. You play what I call reliability chicken. And the biggest offender is, unfortunately, where I live in California. I mean, the biggest offender in the U.S., because that's what we that's why we had big blackouts last summer and we why we've been in danger because we're trying to shut down as many reliable power plants as we can including nuclear plants by the way which is doubly insane and we're trying to rely on our solar and wind but we're really relying on out of state power from Arizona uh, from Utah from Nevada but the problem is they're trying to have more unreliable energy too so everyone is trying to play unreliability chicken and they're relying on reliables like just one example is in LA, I posted something on Twitter last year. Like at one point they were getting at least 40% of their electricity from coal, I believe mostly from Utah. So it's not in California, right? We don't have any coal in California, but we're getting coal turned into electricity and delivered to California. But the more that this is, it's just, it's this parasite game. And so the reason I'm going into this is because I know everyone is going to hear these claims of solar and wind are cheap, et cetera. And it's all what I call accounting fraud or partial cost accounting. There is, the important thing is there is no standalone solar wind battery thing that anybody uses anywhere because it's so cost prohibitive. And so if anyone thinks it's a good idea, they should prove it in reality by creating like Apple. If they're going to be 100% renewable, great, create your own installation. But instead what they do is they plug into the grid, they parasite on coal and gas and nuclear, and then they sometimes add a bunch of unreliable solar and wind and they say, hey, look, we ran on all the solar and wind. 
and you guys used all the coal. But that's not how it works physically. That's like the analogy is like if you take a sailboat, if you take a, a diesel powered boat across the ocean and you put a sail on it and the sail gives it 10% of its energy, you as Tim Cook don't get to say, I got there on the sail and the rest of you guys got there on the diesel. That's what Apple is doing when they say they're 100% renewable. It seems to me one of the biggest things that is a blindness for most people and myself before reading your book to do with thinking towards the future is the misunderstanding of the fact that energy permits technology advancement and future technology can fix many of the problems that the energy consumption is going to cause in the present. Is that a fair way to frame it? I think it's a, it's a very good way to frame it. I mean, it, it, it does it in the future and in the present. So I've focused a bit on the present because even if you, th if you think about like climate, it's very important that climate-related disaster deaths are down 98% over the last century. Like nobody talks about this. Just to show you how biased the system is, the UN IPCC, which has some, that's called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Like you look at all their reports, it's all about how we're endangering climate. They never mention climate-related deaths or climate-related disaster that's going way down. That is like, I mean, how could you, that's like you're doing a report on like malaria. Like if malaria had decreased by 98% and you were studying like a malaria crisis, like you would need to point out that it's been decreasing. So, it, but nobody even talks about this. So we have this blindness because we, we have this belief that it's wrong to impact the climate, that it's gotta be self-destructive. So we don't even look at the numbers. We don't even notice, hey, wait, haven't we developed all these good technologies for protecting ourselves from climate? Like building homes and heating and air conditioning and like drought relief is the most amazing because drought could kill millions of people in the past. I mean, you look, I have some headlines in my next book, Fossil Future, which um, it's not out now. You can't even get it on Amazon. By the way, I just, sorry, one note to interrupt. This is a temporary thing, but do not buy the revised moral co case for fossil fuels on Amazon because it's a fake book. So don't do that. No the way. Who's done that? It. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's not, it's not anyone screwing me. It's just, th they messed up. It was basically my book fossil future was originally conceived as a revision. And then I ended up writing a whole new book, but still on Amazon, it says revised. And so it just, it kills me that people are buying that book and it's not going to get delivered. So just I'll don't. find the correct link and it will be in the <laughs> show notes below. Yeah. Just more with the one with the blue cover, the, the bright blue cover that I sent you. That's, that's fine. So sorry for, for that, but it's just, it's been bothering me, uh, lately. So where did we, of course, I interrupted myself. On, talking um, about technology, the future of technology. And oh, yeah. You're oh, talking drought. about droughts. Yeah, yeah, drought. Drought is like these stories about, you know, just reading about places like China and just millions of people dying from these droughts. It's just so, it's so tragic to think about what people living in like a more natural world without modern technology, what that's like. And now we have, you know, modern irrigation, a lot of which is high energy. And we have drought relief convoys where you can give you know, food to people who can't grow food. And, you know, drought related deaths now go down to like the level of a thousand a year. It's just this unbelievable thing. Nobody talks about like drought. We're so good at mastering drought that I have never heard anyone explain any possible situation that could actually be a drought problem globally. Also true. Interestingly, it's true for wildfires. Now that seems impossible given what we've seen in Australia and California. But if you look at like what we have at our disposal in terms of modern fire management, in terms of if you actually thin the forests, if you don't allow these huge fuel loads to build up, if you build barriers, like there's no conceivable scenario where fires could be a big problem. It's all this man-made stuff that actually comes from this whole anti-impact approach where we say, we're not allowed to clear the brush. We're not allowed to do control burn, controlled burns. We're not allowed to do logging. And so we basically treat, create, the, we make the forest a bomb. But that's, a, that's not, like if the temperature rose three or four degrees and we manage the forest properly, we would not have a, a problem with fires at all. So it's actually really hard to think of anything that even today's capabilities can't deal with, let alone tomorrow's. I mean, the most plausible is like a super rapid sea level rise. So if you talk about like multiple feet per decade, which Al Gore makes us think is going to happen because he talks about 20 feet in his movie and he's not very clear about when that's going to happen. But, you know, the what we've been experiencing is like a foot a century. And then, the, you know, some of the high predictions are like three feet in a century. That is not even a problem for today's levels, let alone imagine if sea levels were rising and we had an issue. Imagine how many like smart people could help us deal with that. We already have a hundred plus million people living below sea level now. 
So once you start to really think in a pro-human, pro-technology way about climate, you don't think of it as this religious thing that, oh, it was perfect and it's wrong if we impact. If you just think of it as, hey, here's another factor that we want to deal with constructively, it's really hard to think of anything that could be like a big problem with what we have today, let alone um, the future. And, and this is controversial, but in the future, we all will also learn how to improve climate. Um, I mean, that's, 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 that's sacrilege, which shows you that it's a religious kind of thing. But like, as this guy points out in this really good book, where's my, I think it's called where's my flying car by this guy named Jay stores hall, a really good book. Like he points out, imagine how much people would pay to make their climate like California's climate, which I, I'm lucky enough to live in California. Like that would be so much value. People are going to figure out how to do that. And that just goes to show that our, if we also, if you wanted to, you can, I believe fairly safely reduce the amount of sunlight coming to the US. Like you can sort of mimic what a volcano has done. Like we know that volcanoes in the past have cooled the earth. Like you could test that out and mimic it, I believe in a safe way. I'm not in favor of it now because I don't think it's necessary. But this idea that we're just, we face an existential threat from warming and all we can do is just outlaw all the fossil fuels and mandate unreliable solar wind. I just want to stress it's a religious perspective. It's not a scientific perspective. None of it makes any sense. I think we should be using more fossil fuels, but even if we weren't, we should be using nuclear. We should be looking at technological ways to deal with it. And we should recognize that the biggest problem in the world is lack of energy for billions of people, not one or two or three degrees warmer. You've hit one of the tripwires that I've laid around this conversation. You just said existential risk there. What are your <laughs> thoughts on Extinction Rebellion? <laughs> I mean, it's... Uh, I don't know how many people even know about them. I mean, I know in, in the UK, they're very, very well known. Yeah, I, I mean, have US. you seen, did you see them smashing the windows of, was it Barclays or Santander's headquarters? Do you see this? I see some of it. I mean, it, like I'm very kind of US focused. Yeah, so yeah, I, yeah. I, I well, follow some. Dude, it, I've never seen someone smash a window in a less cool way. Like they literally can't smash windows in a cool way. It, you, you swing a thing at a big thing and it makes a big crack. But no, 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 no. They've arrived with this sort of mallet and chisel and with their masks on and a pink beanie doing all of the four corners. It's, what, are you, like, what are you trying to demonstrate? Is this wanton destruction of glass, which presumably is going to need fossil fuels to then <laughs> re-deliver the glass <laughs> back to fix it? Or... Are you enacting some sort of rage? Because if that's your rage, I'm not tremendously scared of it. But yeah, so I have a, I have a big problem with Extinction Rebellion, right? And it's because I'm a big fan of existential risk. Have you read Toby Ord's The Precipice? No. Oh, dude. Alex, let me, let me, I'll tell you once we're done. Everyone that's listening has already heard me talk about it a million times. Um, basically, Toby, Toby runs mathematical models. He's a philosopher from the Future of Humanities Institute in Oxford, which is the number one existential risk research lab, basically, in the world. Mm -hmm. And he runs the numbers, the likelihood of us going extinct, humans, existential risk, so a um, global irreversible neutering of our capacity to reach our full potential as a civilization is roughly the definition he uses of existential risk. And he notes them all down and he has the natural risks and then he has the anthropogenic risks as well over the next century. The likelihood that climate change is an existential risk to us is one in 10,000. The likelihood of super intelligent artificial general intelligence that's misaligned is one in 10. Natural pandemics, one in 30. Engineered pandemics, one in 100. Super volcanoes, one in a million. Uh, gamma ray bursts, one in a billion, etc., etc. It pales in comparison. And m m the, this sort of leads me to the problem I have with Extinction Rebellion, which is, whose extinction are you bothered about? Genuinely, wh wh what is the extinction that you're concerned about? It should be existential risk rebellion. If it was that, and they were looking at the actual statistics around what is the most likely thing to cause humans to go extinct, that's the question that presumably they're talking about. But it, it gets all conflated with this sort of naturalistic human racism. And, well, it's not just about that. It's The animals shouldn't be going extinct either. Okay, cool. Do you know that we need to be able to develop technology to save animals and ourselves from the non-zero number of natural background risks that occur? So if we were to continue, let's say that we ceased all technological progress now and just went back to being nomads, the human race won't leave the planet, we won't go to Mars, 
we will die because there is a non-zero existential risk number in the background, whether that be engineered pandemics or natural pandemics. Well, it wouldn't be engineered because those, those labs would have been shut. Natural pandemics, super volcanoes, whatever it might be, asteroids, right? So we need technology to protect ourselves. We're also, the lions aren't going to do it for us. So if we stop doing it, they're all dead. Every animal on the earth will die eventually. Even if you want to roll the clock forward a little bit more, whatever it is, 2 billion years, the sun's going to expand and the earth's going to be gone. If you want to save the maximum number of future potential lives, both human and in terms of the animals, the best thing that we can do is focus our attention onto not dicking up the big risks that we have over the next century. One in 10 is the likelihood that Toby Ord, the in the epicenter of existential risk research puts on artificial general intelligence being the thing that we could it's the number one risk right the number one risk i mean i don't i don't believe those numbers at all but i i i, I agree with a lot of the thrust of what you're you're talking about i mean and, and you know one way to think of it you can think of technology and progress from the perspective of like what is human being what are our capabilities and all things being equal, you know, you want more capabilities going forward to deal with a wide variety of things. So when I was drafting Fossil Futures, I was writing a part of it. This was before COVID. And I was, not I was noting like, hey, here are the things I'm really concerned about, you know, and, and, and I wish I had said, oh, like, uh, you know, a pandemic from a flu-like but more extreme virus. I didn't say that. But I, antibiotic resistance is definitely one that I – and it's not like existential as in everyone's going to die, but like that is a real – there's a real thing that you can see. It's the antibiotics are amazing, but they have these side effects and you see resistance. And like the more capable you are as a civilization, like the more you can kind of deal with anything. So it, it, it's a very high burden of proof to show we should focus all on dealing with one thing, particularly if it has any chance, let alone, I believe a certainty of neutering our capability. So if it's like, let's stop using energy, like let's, let's make energy more expensive and less reliable so that we can sort of make nature more friendly to us in this one respect. Like it, our whole, so I mentioned before, like everything in our society depends, it's like, it's a machine, it's produced by a machine or it's produced by the time, human time freed up by machines. You think about, we want millions of people, if there's a pandemic, to be able to think about it and deal with it and, and help us treat it like that's only possible with the machine labor civilization. So in general, I totally agree that the more capabilities we, the more freedom you have and the more ability you have to, to make progress, the more you can deal with any of these kinds of things. And so the, it's notable that often the anti-technology, the people concerned about technologies, you can say, like there's one of two ways to deal with it. If, if you think there's a real threat, you can say, okay, let's, let's sort of evolve and figure out how to deal with the threat or let's just withdraw technology. And, in general, there's a very strong attitude of let's withdraw technology. And it's such a bad attitude. And it's also a completely impractical attitude because you cannot control the rest of the world. Like correct, if you look at correct, fossil correct, fuels, yes. I've been writing a lot about China. Like we are such useful idiots with regard to China. Like China is using more and more coal. Like in 2020, you know, they have record 2020 pandemic year, mind you, like record oil imports. They have um, three Texas worth of coal plants, uh, new coal plants uh, under development, like all these different markers of more and more fossil fuel use. And China is there like the productive center of the whole world. Like we in the US, you in the UK, you're using China. So we're all using Chinese coal, whether we think about it uh, or not. There is no chance that China is gonna stop using fossil fuels so long as it's the most cost effective way for them to do things. And we are totally delusional about this. And so even if you thought, yes, yeah, CO2 is a big issue, like you have to look for truly technological means of dealing with it, which either means you, you find a way like to capture the CO2, which is a total bitch, which I, I don't think is very promising at all, but people can try to do that. Um, you can try to figure out how to cool the planet, which I think if it w there was a real problem, that's where you would focus your energies, or you can try to develop like non-carbon alternatives, including nuclear, uh, which, as I said, people should, we should do that anyway. We should focus on that anyway. Uh, but that is, that that does take a long time. That's like a multi-generational thing. But this idea that, oh, we're going to stop, like this idea that, oh, we're going to make our own sacrifices and pledges, and then China's going to go along with it. It's a, just another example of like, you cannot hold back 8 billion people from making progress. So you just better make the best progress you can, including to counter the problems that the progress causes. This is a justification for a totalitarian state, if ever I've heard one. 
all of these people with their freedom to talk, their freedom to post and tweet whatever they want and do research. North Korea. North Korea can use as much fossil fuels as they want. Or China, they can use them all. It's, it, it is interesting when you think about it, a very broad sort of civilizational perspective, you're going to see a power swing. I, I wonder, neutering is the word that I always use. I wonder how much progress is being neutered in the West by a focus on technologies which are inherently less efficient, which inherently slow down our capacity to be able to move forward and to keep up with the East. And China are a terrifying force at the moment, and that's only going to get worse if you decide to strap one of our hands behind our backs. Yeah, it's it's really... I've become... I'm surprised I wasn't more interested in this before. I've become really interested in the last six or nine months. It's... I mean, there are some things that reassure me just because it's not a free country, so that gives it a lot of, of impediments. But it's really scary that this sort of totalitarian anti-fossil fuel movement, because it, it has a totalitarian quality, like we're going to abolish this. And it always involves imposing these new green energy things, like like Joe Biden is going to tell us how to do it. So it, it has this whole like so-called central planning uh, government control to it, which is just, it's a disaster on its own. And then you're mandating these religiously preferred like unreliable technology. So it is scary to think of the freer countries in general becoming the least free with regard to energy because that's the industry that powers every other industry. So that's your economy and it's also your security. Like the US is only as secure as we are because we have such a productive economy that can, you know, that can keep us secure by manufacturing these weapons and stuff. And then also, so we're neutering like our fundamental industry and we're actually like exporting it to China. So we're having chi the Chinese use fossil fuels to make us our unreliable energy. Like they're making the solar panels and wind turbines and then using fossil That's fuels. That's mental. And then, That's such a <laughs> And then also thing like there's about. the whole issue of stealing all the patents and like that's that's totally okay because you know one of the issues with a place like China is innovation but if you allow people to steal all of your innovations like once you have the innovation and and there's a you know you have prototypes of things then that can be copied and we know that this regime has an explicit goal of world domination or at least you know being the world's superpower by 2049 and so the i really think I just think about what are the Chinese dictators thinking when they see the US and the EU? I mean, my private joke is like, I think of it as like useful idiots or like US full idiots and EU's full idiots, you know, for the US and the EU, because it's you just it's one of these scary things that you feel like you see, like you look at the past and you're like, okay, you gotta do something about this Hitler guy, right? Like he is rising, like this is not gonna go well. And it's like, oh, yeah, you, Chamberlain, you make a deal with him. Yeah, that's really going to work, right? He's going to be totally satisfied and he'll just hang out with his mistress all the time and be like, no, he's not going to be appeased. And you just think like China's on this clear trajectory and we fit it into it perfectly by buying unreliable energy, gutting our own capabilities and then praising them. I mean, I, like, I don't want to pick on Elon too much, but like he was like, I'm so impressed with China's efforts toward carbon neutrality. Larry Fink, the most powerful man in the financial world, head of BlackRock, he's like, in his le annual letter to CEOs, which is incredibly influential, he talked about like, he his only mention of China and talking about how we're going to become carbon neutral is China made like an inspiring commitment to be carbon neutral. And I tweeted about this, like this is the same year they're using record oil imports, like five year high of coal production, all these it's just the idiocy. It's this blindness. It's dangerous, man. It's, it's really, so, really dangerous. I mean, it's dangerous. I mean, it's always, da you know, nothing's more dangerous than no energy, except no energy and a highly energized, ambitious uh, enemy. God. Yeah, I am. Um, the useful idiots thing is interesting. Douglas Murray had this quote where he said, when the barbarians are at the door, we'll be debating about what gender they are. And the equivalent here is when the barbarians are at the door, we'll be asking whether or not they're going to knock our door down with green energy fueled cars or not. Like that, that's, that's how it is. It, it, when you saw the Capitol Hill riots, right? When you saw that occurring, Russia and China must have been thinking, I, I don't know whether how much influence they had on it or not, probably more than most people know, because it seems like they always just have more influence on all of the shit that goes on than most people know. But they must have just, even if they weren't, they must have been sitting thinking, I can't believe it. They're tearing themselves apart. We, we don't have to do anything here. They, they, they are literally tearing themselves apart internally. And 
as much as I love a democracy and I want capitalism and personal sovereignty and meritocracy, everyone can be whatever they want to be. I don't know. I, I wonder how long do you let a world power with defined objectives to take over the globe? How long do you allow them to keep going forward before you say, right, okay, sort of the children that want to debate amongst themselves in the EU and in America, that we need to have some more forceful or restricted choices in terms of how public policies run because allowing the public to vote appears to be getting us in a direction that's actually neutering our capacity do you know what i mean i'm not i'm not i'm not advocating for a totalitarian state here but if the consensus amongst the electorate is so far away from what is optimal for the country and perhaps the world at large how long do you allow that to go on for well, there's a question of who, because I think in, certainly in America and probably probably in Europe as well, you know, the intellectuals are generally worse. So the, you know, the when I'm you know, in terms of the intellectual elite of the society, you know, you can think of them as the thought leaders, or sometimes call them the designated experts. Like these are the people, certainly on energy and environmental issues. Um, like these are the people pushing for net zero. Like if you look at the average American when they're polled and they say. You know, there are these studies to the effect of like, how much would you, do you care about climate change? Yes. How much would you pay per month to deal, do deal with climate change? They're like less than $10. Like, I actually think that's pretty rational in terms of just like, there's a sort of common sense. Yeah, this is kind of something I care about, but it's pretty remote and the world is not ending. And people have been kind of talking about this a long time. And like, I really need that $10 and people really do need their money. It's, you know, most people don't have very much of it and there's a lot that we need to do. Like versus these, these uh, the leaders, which I'm really calling the useful idiots, which is they're like they're totally willing to just risk the entire civilization on this idea. Like just think about the net zero thing. Even just there's no concern that it might not work as implemented. I say there's no evidence it could work in any way. But like you just think about how badly like your average Amtrak, that's a train in the U.S., like how bad like a rail project is. And they're making all these plans for like trillions of dollars. And we already see what's happening in places like Texas and California with relatively small amounts of unreliables. Like there's not even a concern that we might do this the wrong way. That's how drunk people are on this goal of eliminating our impact, particularly eliminating our climate impact. And then the specific means of what they would call renewable, what I'd call unreliable energy. So I, I think you don't really have a, it's really the leaders. And that's, that's the, that's the scary thing. It, Cause if we're just, Oh, the leaders are wise. And then the people are just on this terrible track, but it's more like, no, the, the people are finally catching up to the leaders. Or I think with, you know, Biden and Trump, what we had is there were so many issues about them that were not related to this issue of energy. Like, I think it's very, plausible that somebody who wasn't Trump and didn't have a bunch of issues associated with him could have beaten Biden. And then we, the U S wouldn't be going in this, uh, kind of direction, but it's at least to the point where what Biden is proposing doesn't strike most people as, Oh yeah, that's going to destroy our country. It's like, Oh yeah, that sounds like kind of an interesting idea. I've, I've heard that Tesla is, all, you know, Apple is all solar and wind and Tesla is all solar. And so that shouldn't be too hard. That shouldn't disrupt my life very much versus no, what you experience in Texas is like a, is a dream compared to what, we would experience if these policies actually existed. Cataclysmic. I love it. Alex, man, thank you for coming on. The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, the correct one, will be linked in the show notes below. If people want to do a little bit more digging or further educate themselves, where should they go? Thanks for asking. So I put up a website called energytalkingpoints.com, and that sort of breaks down every issue you can imagine and in very sort of bite-sized and well-referenced chunks. So I definitely say check out energytalkingpoints.com. And if you want to be on my mailing list, I send out one email a week with just the latest stuff that's going on, alexepsteinlist.com. And then I'm on twitter.com slash alexepstein. Perfect, man. Thank you very much. Good luck with the new book as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few months. And don't forget to subscribe. It makes me very happy indeed. Peace.